So, um, why am I here? I'm here to um, introduce you to, uh, it used to be called neuromarketing when I started, it's now called consumer neuroscience, it's considered to be a slightly more, um, uh, what's more sedate, uh, less sort of commercial term I suppose. Um, I, uh, my background is actually a marketer. Um, I'm not a neuroscientist as I was introduced actually, although I feel sometimes like I am because I've spent much of the last 10 to 12 years with neuroscientists. Um, but I am, I am actually a human being. Um, and I used to work for companies like Diageo and Disney uh, uh, and uh, Universal Studios and stuff on brands like Smirnoff and Foster's and, and so on. And I got very frustrated with traditional research methodologies. Um, particularly when testing creative outputs like advertising and packaging and brand propositions and such, to the point where I really could not believe the results which were being put in front of me. And I felt we were making the wrong decisions in following the advice of traditional research. Um, when I met a neuroscientist when I was at um, Disney, I immediately realized that there was, because he was uh, what we now call the grandfather of neuromarketing, a guy called Dr. David Lewis, he was out there talking to companies like Saatchi and Saatchi in Charlotte Street in the 1980s about a new methodology he'd come up with for measuring how people really feel about advertising and, and packaging as opposed to what they would tell you. Okay, so that's the beginning of the story and it will, it will unfold as I go on. This, this is just an example of the number of companies the names of companies who are using these kind of techniques, of which there are many nowadays. Um, but the industry is really only about 15 years old, and I would say it's in the last five years it's really accelerated. But you, you see here the usual suspects you'd expect to be on there, like FMCG companies, uh, P&G, Unilever, Coke, Pepsi, um, but also retailers, auto companies, media companies, um, uh, pharma companies, financial services, Almost every sector is now involved in one way or another. So the question is, what, why, why are they interested in this? Well, this is like, you don't need to spend too much time analysing this, but basically the market research industry has been formalised for maybe 50, 60 years, you know, from those days before Madman and, and so on, um, you know, where focus groups first become, became a thing and motivational research and, and psychology started to kind of get a hold in marketing as a formalised industry. And if you look through there, you'll, you'll recognise various terms like ethnography and, um, and uh, social media and, and conjoint semiotics, all this sort of stuff. So there's been a series of innovations over the years, okay? And what have they done? I'm sorry, they haven't done very much, actually. What they've done is they've helped a little bit in make what is a, a, a pretty, pretty pitiful performance in terms of what market, marketing research delivers. They've improved it a little bit. What I mean by that is... That old adage that you, you could toss a coin and, and probably get more value and, and save, save your budget is still true to a, to a fair degree today. Um, so whilst these things have helped little by little, they haven't really transformed the ability of market research to do the two things which we demand of it, which is what? Number one, predict what actually people are going to do. And number two, try and explain it so we can then do something about it next time. And, but what we've now got... Uh, is neuromarketing or consumer neuroscience. This is not like a new technique for packaging or advertising or anything else. It's a completely different parallel universe. It's actually looking, instead of asking people questions, it's actually looking below the level of consciousness and trying to understand how people are genuinely responding. We couldn't do this before. Marketers, from the day I started it, Beecham's, as it was in those days in 1981, have been talking about, oh, we need to get more emotional, we need to understand emotions. We haven't been able to do it until the last 5, 10, 15 years. So that's the, the, the impact of it. The science behind it, five, I think, five, four or five facts I've got here for you. Um, those of us who work in neuroscience <laughs> can never go to a presentation without seeing an iceberg. True? <laughs> yep. So what we're saying here is 95%, we now know from, from neuroscience, 95%-ish of our decisions are generated at the non-conscious level. Even though we think we're logical, rational human beings, actually, our responses are driven, we are, we are emotional human beings, and we're wired emotionally, not rationally. We learn to be rational because that's how people tend to judge us. Okay, so it's all about the non-conscious. Um, think about a situation which we do a lot, those of us who work with FMCG clients, you know, you're in front of a fixture. At that moment in time, you may be processing this number of things in your mind non-consciously and just about these consciously. So when you think, shall I buy that toothpaste or this, 
you're in this territory, not that territory. If you actually, um, uh, I mean, you'd probably be in, in the supermarket for months and months and months uh, otherwise if we didn't have this part of our brains. Okay. Um, fact three. Um, this guy you know, has the credit for, for um, publicizing um, uh, this, this kind of thinking that there are two ways that we kind of structure our uh, thought processes. One is what we call system one and one is what we call system two. If you quickly glance through there and there, you get a feel for it immediately. One is an automatic kind of way of thinking, almost autopilot, okay? Which is, how many of you um, drive? Yeah? So when you go on a, a journey to work or wherever, you have no recollection of how you really got there, have you? Yes, you might remember that you must have turned here and there and maybe avoided a car, an accident somewhere. But largely, you don't remember when you change gear or when you indicate. You just do it automatically. That's what this is. It's automatic. That's what we, we basically are on auto drive the whole time. Explicit is when we stop and think, oh, hang on a second. Which way do I need to go? How do I, shall I go? Because it, it's, it's at the, go the long way or the short way or... Do I need to pass this way? So you're thinking and it's effortful. It's, it uses up energy, which is why thinking about things is hard. That's why any of you who work on strategy, you've got to think, oh, God, I've got to write a strategy paper. It's because you need brain power to do it. It's not automatic and associative like this. OK, both these things work, and we need to understand both of them. But this is what really drives our perception and ultimately drives our kind of um, tendencies and uh, habits. This is what we're kind of aware of and what actually guides us in the short term and overrides sometimes this stuff. Fact number four, people say that there are rational decisions and emotional decisions. This guy, um, you know, in, in a, to give you a very short version, has demonstrated amongst many others that actually every decision has got an element of emotion in it, even what we consider to be the most rational. So I uh, do a lot of work with Sky, for example, uh, a few years ago, and they were saying to me, yeah, yeah, you're right, Tom, but when it comes to taking out a subscription, that's a, a rational decision. I said, well, is it? So the evidence is that uh, there's emotion in, in every decision. That's why it's not just nice to, to, to measure it, it's important to measure it. Fact five... The thing is, we can't really articulate our emotions. These are complex things, and they don't, they're not neatly parceled into one, this emotion, that emotion, that emotion. They're very, very mixed up together. And putting a number of value on it is something that's very, very difficult to do in terms of articulation. So A, we don't know about them. B, we can't really express them anyway. So we need to find a way of getting at them, which we couldn't do by simply asking people questions. When you ask somebody about an emotion, it changes it. The more you delve into it, the more it changes it. So it's no surprise that if you're doing uh, focus groups, depth interviews, that you can sit somebody down and they'll give you an explanation at the front end. An hour and a half later, they've waxed lyrical about it and they've come up with a really brilliant story as to why they've done what they've done. How often do they reverse their decision? Hardly ever. Um, it's because the brain is really good at inventing. We're great at creating stories to make us sound, logical, and rational, and, and, and sensible human beings. So the value of this stuff is that when, you, up until now, we've, we've really been asking people questions, and we hear what people say. And of course, we can see what people do. We can measure behavior. But what we've be, what's been missing is this thinking, feeling area. Put the lot together, and you've got a much clearer picture of the, the overall jigsaw puzzle. This is something that's very, very simplistic. And every time I put it up, you know, professors of neuroscience probably will turn in their graves and say, you can't do that. But this is really um, the idea that you, know, you have observation, reaction, and expression. And there are three phases. And um, so this is um, what we try to measure with the neuro, the newer techniques, is this instinctive, automatic response, uncontrolled response, as opposed to this, where we say, oh, tell me, what do you think of this presentation? Now, I've asked you a question, by the way. Very good so far. Yes, <laughs> but why are you saying that? Because I'm engaged. Yeah, because you, you feel under pressure, because, no. you know, you're on camera. Well, yeah, yeah. But, you know, all those reasons suddenly come into your head. You know, you, you, you're, 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 the moment you're asked a question is the moment it's no longer an implicit or non-conscious response. That's not to say it's not valuable. It's just to say it's not, not the pure thing. What we're trying to do is measure this area. And all these techniques of which uh, Will and Mev will be talking about later as examples are trying to measure, capture some of that kind of stuff. Why would we do it? It's because 
by measuring this stuff, we can evaluate what people think and feel as opposed to what they say. The beauty of it is in many cases it's quantified data. And quantified data, you know, it's, it can be more robust, it can be tested and validated more easily. Um, we're able to, uh, particularly with, with uh, uh, these two techniques actually, they're both time dependent, so we can actually follow how people, um, people's responses changing over the journey of the ad or the path that they're navigating and identify the cause and effect triggers. That's really, really valuable in order to be able to do something about it and improve it afterwards. The, and because we're looking at the non-conscious, uh, below the waterline, as it were, it's not surprising that we come up with more insights that we can't get at from doing the same old focus groups and quant surveys and, and social media surveys that, that, that everybody does nowadays. So the number of times that clients have come to me to say, Oh my God, I can't believe it. We did another survey, it's told us the same thing, a tracking study, we're just finding it. It's telling us nothing new. We need to find out something new and different and fresh. This is the kind of territory where you can start to find that. Um, and more and more evidence is, is uh, accruing on the ability, not surprisingly, because it's driven by system one, um, instinctive risk kind of responses, we're, we're, we're getting more, you can get more accuracy from being able to, to predict how people are actually going to behave. So those are the reasons why those clients you saw at the beginning are all interested and why more and more people are adopting these techniques. What for? Well, a whole range of different stuff, whether it's ad testing or event testing or website optimization, tactile stuff, multi-sensory stuff, you know, the, the feel of something, the aroma, you know, the, the taste of something. Whether these two actors or broadcasters do a better job as resonating with professional, um, uh, have some gravitas, but are still streetwise. If you're looking for those combinations, for castings and stuff like that, we're using it for film and TV work, testing of new programs, voice casting, sponsorship, you know, you, can, you name it. Almost everything that traditional market research has tried to get at, there is an equivalent now, or many equivalents, in terms of testing it at a non-conscious level. So clients who've been using it for a while, this is actually from um, a media lab in uh, Columbus Circus just uh, off, um, uh, just there in New York. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, they'll be testing all kinds of different things. This, this lab is loaded, you can see the cameras there, you know, for uh, looking at people's expressions. There's eye tracking stuff in here, there's EEG stuff in here. There's all, all the stuff is loaded into one place and it's being used, you know, really on a, on a daily basis to iteratively test things. So, to move to the last few slides, how do we do this stuff? Well, there are loads of new t technologies and tools coming out all the time. And there's just a, a sample there for you. But what we tend to do is to, is to group them into three main areas. There's stuff called neurometrics, biometrics, and psychometrics. By their very name, the, the clue is in the name in a way, neurometrics are things that measure activity directly in the brain, neuro in the brain. So things like EEG and SST, steady state topography, but whatever we'll be talking about. Um, fMRI, have anybody had an fMRI scan here? Count yourself lucky. Um, okay, very noisy, but very, very invaluable for understanding how the brain kind of works and responds at a deep level. Um, EEG, um, so these are a deeper, quite sophisticated, I call it really the hardcore end of, of neuromarketing or consumer neuroscience because it tends to need some very, very, very specialist knowledge, okay? Uh, tends to be higher, more expensive, it's not so scalable and so on, but very valuable um, in many ways. Biometrics or physiometrics in which, um, by the way, yeah, this is the area, we haven't got an SST slide on there, but you're going to show one later on, okay? Uh, and moment by moment, very valuable. You're dizzy. <laughs> uh, biometrics, physiometrics, this is to do with, as it sounds, it's how the body reacts. So this can be things like um, sweat, uh, a bit like um, a polygraph. Uh, you know, lie detector is a, is a form of measurement that we, we use. We call it something different. Um, but that measures, you know, people's activation or calming, calming effect. Um, facial decoding, which some of you will be aware of. Um, eye tracking, which Will will be talking about, and online eye tracking, which is really sort of um, uh, becoming increasingly valuable. And then various biometric measures of heartbeat, blood pressure, breathing techniques, 
uh, pupil dilation. There's uh, all kinds of things are coming out all the time, very, very techy. Um, these tend to be um, good. Some of them are kind of moment by moment. It tends to be uh, perhaps not as expensive as the EEG and the SST stuff, um, but still have got a value and often used in combination with these other techniques. The third area, the final area, is an incredibly powerful area called uh, implicit response testing, um, association testing. I've just done a, um, a webinar come from there um, to people around the world talking about this technique, which is probably the, one of the fastest growing areas. And this allows you to understand at a quite a granular level how people are responding to, rather than just understand that emotion has been boosted or suppressed, it will be, allow you to understand well which emotions so you can actually do something about it. So the combination of this technique with some of the other techniques is becoming increasingly powerful for advertising. Um, so that, that, that's really yeah. it.